into a destitute family and without completing primary education, Nguyen Tia Bien was a 23-year-old woman working as a farmer and occasionally as a babysitter in her hometown located in the Hipoa district, Bac Yong province, Vietnam. In 1991, she met a man named Quang and became friends with him. The man told her that he knew someone in China who could help her find a job. Nguyen convinced her family to allow her to leave and move to China in order to seek better job opportunities. Upon crossing the border, Kwong sold the 23-year-old to a Chinese man and vanished without a trace. Nguyen was taken to an isolated location where she was held captive in a house and subjected to inhumane treatment. She did not know the language, hence she was unable to communicate nor attempt escape. She was locked inside the house for some time, but was eventually let out, only to be forced to work in the farms. She was kept as a prisoner and allowed only to work and eat. She was sometimes allowed to go to the market. In later interviews, she said, quote, I cried all day, and every time I showed signs of wanting to get out, they, meaning the man and his family, would threaten to beat me. I was so scared and had to do whatever they told me to do. She would spend the next 28 years captive, eventually forgetting how to write or even speak Vietnamese. The kidnapper had promised her multiple times that he would let her go home if she just continued working, but he never did. She eventually gave up all hope and believed that she would die in China. In February of 2019, due to outside circumstances, Police raided local households and found her living inside the home without an ID. She was detained by Chinese authorities for two weeks while they conducted an investigation before ultimately transporting her to the border located in Long Sung Province, Vietnam, in order to send her back home. Accompanying her were seven additional victims from northern Vietnam who had also fallen prey to the same scam of being sold into China under the pretense of better job opportunities. Together, they journeyed around 10 kilometers through a forest in order to reach Lang Sun's main town before parting ways. While back in Vietnam, she met a man named Chan Van Huyen, who was a trader from her hometown. After learning of her circumstances, Huyen uploaded her photos and relevant information, including the names of her parents and their former addresses in Vietnam, onto several social media platforms. This information eventually reached her family, and on August 2nd, Huyen accompanied Nguyen back to Bak Gyeong, where she was joyfully reunited with her loved ones. It's unclear whether Nguyen had any children while in China. Her father, Nguyen Van Nam, is now 82 years old, and expressed how the family had assumed that she had been sold in China and had been searching for her unsuccessfully for many years. According to Nguyen's sister, the returned woman acts far more reserved than her former self and only speaks when prompted, and her proficiency in the Vietnamese language has noticeably declined. Chiama Gray was 14 years old at the time of her mysterious disappearance. Living with her mom, Francine Black, and her older brother, Paul, she was described as an A-plus student attending Buena High in Ventura, California. Loved by her friends and family, by all accounts, she was a happy and well-adjusted teenager. However, like many teens her age, she was interested in boys and dating. In 2007, during her freshman year of high school, Chioma met Andrew Joshua Tefoya, known to his friends as Josh. He was a senior at St. Bonaventure High School, a different school as Chioma, but still in the same district in Ventura. The two initially became acquaintances through Chioma's brother, Paul, as he played football with Josh. Despite their six-year age difference, the two started spending much of their time together. But while the age disparity did not seem to bother the couple themselves, it would go on to disturb many others. Josh was 20 years old. Chioma was only 14. Her mother, Francine, started to notice changes in her daughter, who prior to this had never been in a relationship. Chioma's grades were dropping, and her social life outside of Josh dwindled. One day, Francine received a call from her 14-year-old daughter's soccer coach. They said that Chioma had disappeared during practice and was seen going somewhere with Josh. 
When Francine confronted her daughter, Chioma said that she would stop seeing Josh. Not to take her 14-year-old daughter's word as her bond, the concerned mother also sternly approached the 20-year-old and told him that he was to stay away from her young daughter. But Josh protested by saying that their relationship was one of love and not lust. After her mother's warnings, Chioma seemed to be back to her normal self. Her grades were improving and she seemed to be more engaged with her extracurricular activities. Because of the positive changes she was witnessing, Francine, as a surprise, one day decided to pick up Chioma during her high school's lunch period in order to take her out. But when she got to Buena High, Chioma was nowhere to be found. Francine tried calling her daughter, and Chioma said that she was simply across the street from school, having her lunch off-site. Francine, dubious to the teen's claims, went to look for her and could not find her. Her suspicions were confirmed when Chioma pulled up in Josh's car. After seeing the 20-year-old yet again with the 14-year-old, despite the previous discussion, Francine took Chioma to the police station to get her tested for statutory assault. While Chioma told her mom that she and Josh had not been intimate, Francine knew it was a lie. DNA tests run on her underwear confirmed the presence of male DNA, and it was later shown to be Josh's. Upon hearing this news, Francine called Josh to come over to the house in order to tell him to stay away from Chioma forever. Josh came over, this time with his mother, Miss Tefoya, who said that she was under the impression that Chioma was actually 19 years old. Francine reiterated that the 20-year-old was to stay away from her high school freshman daughter and also quipped that Josh's mother knew quite well the girl was not 19. Not to take the issue lightly, Chioma's mother went to the police, this time to file charges. Josh was arrested for unlawful copulation with a minor, as the age of consent in California is 18 years old. He was sentenced to six months of work furlough, meaning he could work during the day and only needed to come back to the jail at night, a sentence many decried as far too lenient. On Thursday, December 13th, 2007, Francine said that Chioma, under the pretense of normalcy, said goodbye to her and left for school. At 3 p.m., Paul, Chioma's brother, went to pick her up, as he often did, but Chioma failed to meet at the pickup spot in front of her school. Paul tried calling her cell, which she always had on her, but it continuously went to voicemail. Concerned, Paul finally called Francine at 3.15 p.m. and worriedly told her that he was unable to reach his sister. Francine immediately guessed that Chioma was again with Josh. His six months of work furlough had ended that very day. Josh had been released from jail at 12 a.m. and never returned to his parents' house. The police were called and it was discovered that Josh had stolen a car, an Acura. The license plate was put out and police communication led authorities to believe that the pair were on their way to Mexico. Ventura is roughly five hours from the Mexican border, but once they crossed state lines, the case was no longer a local one, but a federal case classified officially as kidnapping, unlawful restraint, and smuggling of persons, due to Chioma being over the age of 14, but under the age of 17. The fact that she was taken outside of the state and outside of a 120 mile radius from her house without parental permission or consent made such charges far more serious. The police called in the FBI to assist on the case, and in addition to local charges, a federal warrant was put out for Josh, enabling far more resources to scan license plates. Soon, a hit came from the stolen Acura. It had crossed into Mexico at 1.20 p.m. There would be many tips and sightings in Mexico of Chioma and Josh. Most of the tips ended up being false, whether intentionally or through air of witnesses. For more than a year, investigators worked the case alongside any and all leads, but to no avail. In June of 2008, the police received a tip that a young woman of African-American descent had been on a website of people who had been recently killed in Mexico. The website detailed that a young girl had been found deceased on arrival, her body charred from a fire. The age, ethnicity, and facial structure matched Chioma, and for a moment in time, the frantic mother Francine braced herself for news of her daughter's death but it would not come as the medical examiner cleared Chioma as the victim in that case. No more news would come for the entirety of the summer, but then, in August of 2008, a woman reported that she had seen Chioma working in a restaurant in Alcapulco, in Mexico. The woman said that after meeting the young girl, 
she had actually looked up her name because it was so unique. She vividly recalls searching for the name Chioma and finding in her search results not the origin of the unique name, but dozens of news articles detailing the brazen kidnapping of a girl who looked identical to the one who had served her. She quickly called the FBI as well as the missing persons organization and reported the sighting, but by the time the authorities got to the restaurant, the pair were nowhere to be found. In November of 2009, Francine received a call from her old friend, a man named Chuck Hookstra. He was now a private investigator and wanted to help, so he took the case pro bono. Chuck traveled to Alcapoco and had flyers printed out. He ended up speaking to a young woman who said that she had worked with Chioma. She also said that she knew Josh personally and mused that the young couple seemed happy and in love. The woman said that the couple told her they were leaving Mexico as Chioma had gotten pregnant. The witness recalls them saying that due to reasons of citizenship, they wanted to have the baby back in the States. With this information, Chuck called many hospitals. However, whether due to privacy reasons or simply in excess of hospital options, he got nowhere closer to locating Chioma or Josh. In January of 2010, nearly three years since she last spoke to her 14-year-old daughter on her way to school, Francine filed a lawsuit against the Tafoya family, claiming they knowingly aided and abetted Josh in his lecherous and illegal activities. With the assistance of attorney Chris Armenta, who had heard about the case and wanted to offer his services pro bono, the mother of Chioma sued Josh's family for custodial interference, intentional infliction of emotional distress, on top of the charge of aiding and abetting. She also filed a lawsuit to be able to access the Tafoya family financial records in order to determine if Josh's extended family had been sending money to him while he was in Mexico. On September 1st, 2011, nearly four years after her daughter went missing, Francine received a phone call from Josh. He said that she urgently needed to come to Mexico to pick up Chioma. Trepidatiously and cautiously optimistic, Francine asked to speak to Chioma. In response, Josh said Chioma was not with him at the moment and that she'd call her tomorrow. However, to the mother's despair, that call never came. Then, over one month later, on October 5th, 2011, after zero communication, Josh shocked all involved when he made a call to the FBI and to the Marshal Service, requesting to surrender at the Los Angeles International Airport. Blissfully to the friends and family of the now 17-year-old, Chioma Gray was in fact alive. But, as Francine feared, she had been groomed and brainwashed almost beyond recognition. Under the backdrop of Chioma being reunited with her family, a new set of challenges emerged. Chioma was not the same person. A victim of what experts say is classic Stockholm Syndrome, Chioma will need time and counseling to fully recognize that she did not consent to going with Josh. A 14-year-old cannot consent to her own kidnapping. Two days after Chioma returned home to her family, the 17-year-old moved out of her mother's home and moved in with Josh's family, the Tefoyas. On January 23, 2012, Josh pleaded guilty to concealing a child and was sentenced to two years in prison. No information exists in public media regarding whether or not Chioma was in fact pregnant or whether that pregnancy ended in a live birth. At last report, the pair were still together and residing with Josh's parents. A special thanks to our patron of the month, Jared. A longtime watcher of the channel, he saw our struggles with demonetization and decided to use patreon.com to help us out in our time of need. Thank you so much, Jared. This helps to continue our mission to tell stories for those who cannot tell their own.